Welcome to Revelation 3, a uh, third in a Bible study series on Revelation, hosted by St. Paul Lutheran Church and School in Boca Raton, Florida. I am Josh Laborious. I host or teach or whatever you want to call uh, me leading this Bible study. Um, for those of you who have been kind of following this playlist, who have been following Bible studies at St. Paul, you'll notice that while this is just being released now, there are already chapters 12 through 22 of Revelation available. And that is because this was all recorded in the midst of COVID-19 and all of the stay-at-home orders with that. So we picked up the videos first where we left off of the in-person study, and that was at chapter 12. Um, but now that we have uh, gone all the way through the rest of Revelation, I'm going back and filling in these videos from the first section. So if maybe you were unable to come to those in-person classes, you can now interact with the material here. So with that, I am, as, as before mentioned, stepping into Revelation 3. And if you re recall in Revelation 2, we were looking at some of these letters to the churches. And these are letters um, written to the angels of the churches, to the prevailing spirits of the churches, whatever the case may be, about um, strengths and weaknesses and, and hope and promises and conviction and, and all these different things for each church. So that's what we're stepping into, is we're stepping into more of those letters. And with that, um, we're going to step into Revelation 3. What I would encourage you to do, what I'm almost going to demand you do at this point, is get out your Bible or get out your phone and pull up a Bible app on your phone um, because I'm going to be referencing this throughout. And in light of that, I'm actually, I'm not going to be putting the text up on the screen. Because I really, I want you interacting with the text in whatever way you usually interact with the text. Um, if for no other reason than it's good practice interacting with the text in whatever method you prefer to interact with it in. So, with that we're going to step into Revelation 3 and we're going to start in the first five, five verses. And it says, To the angel of the church in Sardis write, The words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Yet you still have a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot out his name of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So, here we have... Um, the structure of each of these letters. So the very first thing that we see is it is written to the angel, the angel of the church in Sardis. And then there's a description of the, the Christ and the attributes of Christ that the church needs to see. And here we see the, the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. So I, I want to remind you, going back to our previous video, that um, the seven spirits refer to the Holy Spirit. That's kind of a poetic way of talking about the Holy Spirit. And the, the seven stars are the seven churches. So this is a reminder of a Christ and of the Holy Spirit who actively cares for and walks among the churches. So that's what we have here at the beginning. And it, it reasserts the authority of the message. So we have to the angel of the churches... Um, I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. This is a hard message to Sardis. And what is going on here in Sardis and what the city is kind of known for, it's known for its history. It, it was a Persian center of power. It, the Greeks had a lot of respect for the city and kind of maintained it. But then Rome, when Rome took over and when Rome was the power that, that was... 
it kind of decayed. It was a, it was a city of decay. So as we step forward into the knowledge of the church, it, it talks about this reputation of being alive, but you are dead. And you say, well, how can that be? How can you have a reputation of, of life, but really be, be dead? And uh, a bit of a tangent, I guess I want to go on, is I want to talk about here for a second, the church visible versus the church invisible and the the differences in the similarities. So this is some theological language that um, I think is particularly helpful. So the church visible is really easy to describe. It is the physical gathering, the physical church, like the, the membership roles. Um, and if you go down, you see that if you go to St. Paul on, on Palmetto Road, you see there is the visible church. If you see it on a, on a Sunday morning, not during stay-at-home orders, you see it filled with people, that is the visible church. If you were to look up the membership role, the membership roster of St. Paul, that is the visible church. So that's the visible church. And then on this other hand, we have the invisible church. And the distinction here is the invisible church is those who are faithful. Those who, who have genuine faith in Christ, even if it's just the size of a mustard seed, they, they are among God's elect. Now, the reason for the distinction is it is possible to be in one and not the other. If you are a member of a church, it is possible for you to not have faith. Whether you are a member of that church just because it is the socially acceptable thing to do, because you think... Your kids will be better off if you're involved with the church, whatever the case may be. Um, you might be a member of a church but not have that true faith, that real faith. Um, on the other hand, you could be very easily, you could have faith and be in a situation where you are not able to be a part of a visible church. For example, uh, uh, there might be a faithful Christian in a place like uh, Saudi Arabia or China or something like that where it is not possible, there is not a visible church for them to be a part of, but they do have faith that Jesus Christ has been sacrificed for their sins. So they would be part of the invisible church, even if they're not part of the visible church. The distinction I want to make here is, I think you're hard-pressed to be part of the invisible church in America and not be part of the visible church. Because the, the reality of it is, is we are called to be in community with one another. We're called to gather together, to learn about his word, to, to enjoy the sacraments, to celebrate and support one another in Christian community. And if you are a faithful follower of Christ, you are going to want to do what he says. Like, you're following this guy, you're going to want to do what he says, and he, he says to gather together and to be in community so there is this reality that if you are a faithful Christian, you will do your best to go to church. And I've heard and I've seen this argument of, oh, I believe in Jesus, but I have a problem with institutionalized religion. Well, then you have a problem with a, a lot of Jesus teaching where it says gather together, support one another, care for one another. That's what the church is. So, in reality, if you are a part of the invisible church in a, in a place like America where the visible church is there and accessible, there is not really any valid excuse to be part of the, the invisible church and not be part of the visible church. But that's a little bit of a distinction that I want to make because it walks us into this where they, they might be part of the visible church. This church at Sar Sardis is still gathering. They're still active so they might have this 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 reputation of being alive but they're dead they don't have the faith behind that they they've kind of forgotten why they're together in the first place so they've been accused of being the visible church but letting their their faith letting the i guess the invisible church fade um which are a problem. So it, it talks about, I, I have not found your, your works complete in the sight of my God. Um, so what it's talking about here is works without faith. And there's this reality that without faith, works are dead. So 
in, in, in Lutheran circles especially, and, and this is getting a little theological maybe in painting with broad strokes, but in Lutheran circles there's sometimes almost this fear of talking about good works because we have this, this concern. We don't want to step into works righteousness because we know we don't earn our salvation in any way. Our salvation is a gift given freely. We don't have to do good works to earn that. But I think we, we can't neglect to talk about works because works are not bad. We are called to live with good works. We are called to, out of our faith, let that be expressed in good works. Um, so the faith is the foundation, but, but works follow naturally from faith. Uh, so that's, that's kind of what it's talking about here with Sardis. And it's saying this is a danger. This is a pitfall. And it goes on, it says... Um, Remember what you received and you heard, that faith that is the core of everything you're doing. Keep it and repent. If you won't wake up, I will come like a thief. So this this pitfall of not maintaining the, the invisible church, not maintaining the faith, there, there's obviously a real, real danger to this because faith is what saves us. And saying, remember what you, you first heard. It, it's encouraging them to remember Christ. <laughs> And then it walks into these blessings for those who do remember. It says, The one who conquers will be clothed in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. And by conquering, speaking, persevering with the faith. That, that's, uh, I don't know, a translation, uh, a replacement we can make. Is we can say, when it says, The one who conquers, that's the one who perseveres in the faith. Is being promised eternal life here. Those who walk with God will never be left out of eternal life. This is a promise from God. This is a certainty and a security for you and for me. And that's that's what he closes this, this bit with Sardis with. So with that, we're, we're then going to walk into Revelation 3, starting at verse 7, continuing with verse 7. And verse 7 says, to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, The words of the Holy One, the true one who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one will open. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down at your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you, because you have kept my word about patience, patient endurance. I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world, to try those who dwell on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast to what you have so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven, and my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So, this letter, as all the letters before and all the letters after, has these same structural elements. It starts off speaking to the angel of the church in uh, Philadelphia. And then there's this description of Christ. It says, uh, the words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one will open. So this is emphasizing the certainty, the trustworthiness of Christ. Speaking to this open door of gospel invitation that once Christ has opened this door, no one can shut it. And that's where this level of certainty comes in. And then we get to this, this language about the key of David. And this is a reference actually to the Old Testament to Hezekiah and Hezekiah's steward who was given the, the key of David, which were keys that unlocked everything. It was, the I guess, the metaphorical... The, the key of David is the metaphorical equivalent of the metaphorical um, keys to the kingdom. These, these open everything. These are... This is also a symbol of authority that he can open anything. So that's what Philadelphia is being confronted with or comforted with, um, is this, this Christ who can open 
and no one can shut. He is the ultimate door. He is the ultimate gatekeeper. Um, and then it's written to the church at Philadelphia. So a little background on the city of Philadelphia. We have it's the gateway to the east, which makes it an incredibly important city, commercially speaking. So that there was wealth in the city. Um, it was also a city, however, that was prone to earthquakes. So they, they lived in an area that was probably also prone to uncertainty about the favor of the gods. Because if you, if you put yourself back in the time, they viewed a lot of natural disasters very directly as God or as the gods, um, acting out their emotions or their will in the world. So if there was an earthquake, uh, there would have been a belief that there was a deity who was upset with the city or who was uh, uncertain or there was some sort of conflict. So with earthquakes happening frequently in the city of Philadelphia, this could have very easily become a uncertainty about how the gods felt about people. Um, even as recent, so if we think kind of about when Revelation was, was written, there was an earthquake in Philadelphia as recently as 17 AD. So that means a lot of people who would have been interacting with this text would have had some sort of memory or some sort of direct experience with an earthquake. So it's very possible that this, um, this uncertain, this description of Christ was really helpful because they might have been in this culture that was really uncertain about the gods and this promises Christ as as a certain God a consistent God not a fickle one um, a little bit more about the city they they did have a lot of temples and cultic festival days they were deeply steeped in the pagan tradition as well so that walks us into the church at Philadelphia and the, the words that the that are written, recorded for them. It says, um, I know that you have but little power, and yet you've kept my word and not denied my name. So what this is pointing at is that you have little power. You've kept the faith, but they, they haven't really pushed toward mission. And they're, they're not really a, a felt presence in their community. So that's what we have here. And then it walks into this, I, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and aren't, I will make them come and bow down. First of all, this is speaking to the end of days. This is not speaking to a military conquest or anything in, in the more present time. Um, but I, I had this question when I was teaching this class in person. What does it mean, the synagogue of Satan and Jews who say they're Jews, but they're not? Um, the reality is Jews are defined by their relationship with Abraham's covenant. It, it's not just the, the ethnicity or the nationality or anything, or even a cultural identity. They are part of Abraham's covenant. Christ, Jesus Christ, is the fulfillment of that covenant. So what it's saying here is, if you're a Jew, but you don't believe in Christ, you're not really a Jew because you are denying the Abraham's covenant. They have then been severed from Abraham's covenant. Um, and this might have led to, this, this difference might have led to conflict in Philadelphia. Possibly even persecution by the Jews in the city. So... That is why it's being addressed here. So we have that um, speaking to the Jews and speaking to what Philadelphia is struggling with. And then it has this support for them. It says, because you've kept my word about patience and endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial. This is speaking to the end times. And for that, I would encourage you to go ahead and watch uh, more videos toward the end of this series starting, I don't know, Let's start, say, start at chapter 17 or something like that if you want to get more into what this hour of trial looks like. So uh, put a pin in that until you get to the later videos. Um, but my question for you, and if, if you'd like to start a discussion below, I would love to see that, is how do we hold fast to the faith that we're given? What are some strategies that you use to help really cling to your faith in Christ, especially in times of uncertainty? 
in times of trial, in times of conflict or persecution? Um, what are some strategies you use? And I'd really encourage you to post them because that might be helpful to someone else who is struggling. Um, which walks us forward into the support that's here. To the one who conquers, again, to the one who perseveres in the faith, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God. So we have this, he's saying, I, I'm making him a pillar in the temple. So this would have been, structurally speaking, the most secure place in the temple, which is especially relevant to the earthquake-prone Philadelphia. So God is saying, I am, I'm going to put you in an unshakable place in my temple. And when it talks about writing writing his name, writing the name of the, the new city, this is talking about new citizenship. Um, a citizenship in the kingdom of God, in the kingdom of heaven, in the new city of Jerusalem, where, where no other citizenship really matters. Um, which I think is a struggle because we live in a community, in a society, in a world that is so big on nationalism, on being proud and being really... Uh, invested in an identity that is your nationality. I am American. I am Mexican. I am Canadian. I am Chilean. I am British, Russian, Chinese, whatever, whatever country you hail from there. There's, I think a push to take a lot of your identity from that. But I think this challenges that because it says, no, 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 your name is in Christ. Your identity is in Christ and in your promised place in the city of heaven. Which I think helps us to put perspective. Uh, and it's giving the church in Philadelphia perspective. It says, remember, you, if you persevere in the faith, you are a member of Christ's church. And nothing can take that away. You're secure in that. And that's where this letter to the Church of Philadelphia ends. And then we step into the letter to the church at Laodicea, which starts in verse 14. So to the church at Laodicea, it says, And to the angel of the church in Laodicea, the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation, I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so you may be rich, and white garments so that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and a salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him, and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear... Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So that's what we have here in, in the end of Revelation 3. Uh, structural things, as always, it starts to the angel of the church in Laodicea. And then we have this description of the Christ. Um, and it says the words of the Amen. So at this point, I want to talk about that word a little bit, which we use a ton. Uh, we Every time we pray, we use Amen at least once. Um and we use it in service, in liturgy, in, in all sorts of places. So, what does it mean? Um, at its core, it's a strong affirmation. Literally translated, it, it might be translated something along the lines of, truly, truly. So, it, it's something along the lines of, let it be so. And what's interesting is, when it's used by Christ, it's a solemn declaration. It's an ultimate affirmation, and frequently what we see is we see, uh, most most writings, most use of Amen is at the end of something. Christ usually, a lot of times, uses it at the beginning. He says, this is true. And then he says what is true, because whatever he says is true. Um, and we see this even as far back as Psalm 88, uh, when we're talking about kind of the, the nature of the solemn declaration. Um, 
So we see the Amen at the beginning of Jesus' teachings uh, instead of following as an affirmation or as a response. Um, and then he's called the faithful and true witness, which is a callback to the introduction. It's, it's again, authorizing this language, these letters. It's saying that, you know, Christ has the authority to speak on these things. Um, and then it speaks to him as the beginning of God's creation because Christ was the word. He was the word from the beginning of time. We see in the beginning of the Gospels, the word was God, and then the word became flesh. And the theological word, if you ever want to, I guess, impress your pastor or someone, anyway, um, is the, the language that's used to describe this is this is the pre-incarnate Christ. This is Christ before he was incarnate as a human, as a man. Um, he was the Word. And at this point, I want to take a little bit of a tangent on what we mean when we say the Word of God. Because uh, there, there are three forms of the Word that we talk about. We talk about the personal Word, and that is Christ. And that is kind of the, the priority. And then we have the words that he spoke and the words that people have continued to speak on his behalf based on his Word throughout history and we would call that the spoken word and when someone is preaching faithfully this is one of the the offices or the the responsibilities of the pastoral offices we'll say that is the spoken word of god that is the word of god being spoken aloud to the people um and that is faithful preaching and then we have the written word of god which it has authority and there's a tangent in one of the videos, uh, in one of these videos about fundamentalism, speaking to, we we have faith in the Bible because Jesus says we should trust this word. Uh, we don't have faith in Jesus because the Bible told us to. Um, so, personal word of God, spoken word of God, written word of God. Th those are the three kind of ways we speak about the word. Um, so that's this introduction to how Christ is being described here. And then it talks about the city of Laodicea, I want to give you some background on that city. It was the junction of two key trade routes, so it was an incredibly wealthy city. There was an excellent medical school there. It, it was a prosperous city. But there's a historian who states that there was no city whose spirit and nature were more difficult to describe. You see, because Laodicea had no civic or cultural extremes. They, they were wealthy, and they were pretty satisfied with that. Um, and that was reflected in the church, as this is these are the scathing words that are had for the church in Laodicea. They are, they are neither cold nor hot. So the sin, the danger to their faith here is, is apathy. So I, I want to think about this idea of hot water versus cold water, um, especially in ancient times. If you think about it, hot water is good. Because it's safe. If water has been boiled, if water has been heated, it is safe to drink. Or safe to use for cooking or other things. It, it is useful. If water is cold, on the other hand, you know that it's fresh. Which which also means it's, it's probably pretty safe to drink. It, it's useful again. If water is lukewarm in the ancients, in, especially with the, the aqueduct systems that they had in place... Sorry about that shaking. Um, if water was lukewarm, that meant it had been sitting somewhere for a while and was probably pretty dangerous to drink because if water is sitting somewhere for a while, things tend to grow in it. If you've ever been hiking or camping and, and you need water in a pinch, you don't get it from the puddle on the ground because it's not safe. You get it from water that is running pretty quickly. Um, and for those of you who are aficionados, I know, yes, you can still have parasites and other things living in the water. I get it. Um, so I guess if you're taking this as advice for camping, bring a filter, uh, or make a charcoal filter as you're going, but I digress. Um, so there's this reality that Ancient physicians actually used lukewarm water to induce vomiting. So it, it's a very accessible and, and uh, understandable metaphor. 
And the where it's connected with is this apathy toward both stinging law and the gospel and, and an apathy toward their neighbor. And this in reality is the most stinging response I think we've gotten to so far because he says, I will spit you out. Um, and if we think about it, if you're cold in, in regards to the faith, you're not connected to the faith. You have no regard for the law. Um, and it's very apparent so people know, so Christians would know to reach out, to share the gospel, to share God's love and God's law. On the other hand, if you're hot, if you're, if you're on fire in the faith, you're connected to your faith. You are speaking to the faith. You are living the faith. You are in the faith. And that's also good. Or in a place that is, is helpful. But if you're in the middle, if you're lukewarm, that's kind of the equivalent of you're, you're in the faith. So like maybe you go to church, but you don't really believe, um, you don't really do anything with it, but because you're like in church, people don't really see that they need to witness to you because it looks like you're, you're connected with the faith. So you, you don't have the advantage of the cold in that no one is looking actively necessarily to reach out to you, but you don't have the advantage of the hot because you're not actually in the faith. So that's kind of where it leaves you is outside the faith without anyone reaching out to you. And that's the danger. That's an incredible danger. Um, and then it talks about this asking me for gold and, and white robes. So this is all referring to spiritual wealth. And this is actually a reference to Malachi for spiritual wealth. You have the, the gold refined by fire speaking to that spiritual wealth, not physical wealth. And then these white garments that represent purity, and they're symbolic frequently of forgiveness. So that's what we have in this, in kind of the encouragement of seek after these things. Uh, seek to be on fire in the faith. Um, and then it speaks, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come and eat with him. So he's offering to, to be in communion with us, in community with us. This is active on the part of Christ. He is reaching out to us. Um, and then it speaks, finally, it says, To the one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne. And again, this is to the one who perseveres in the faith. We are going to be rulers and conquerors with Christ. And that is the gift we're given. So that is where Revelation 3 leaves off. Um, if you have any questions and comments, this YouTube channel is monitored. If you comment and you have a question, um, I will do my best to get to it. So um, anyway. Blessings on your day. Don't forget to like the video if it was helpful for you. Subscribe to the channel if you want more. And go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.